Let's take out our Bibles and learn together. If someone were to say, I want to experience God, I want Him moving in my life, I want to know His presence, His provision, and His power in my life. Well, if that describes you, then Psalm 25 is perfect. Psalm 25 is an excellent psalm in teaching us numerous principles on how to live, think, behave in such a way that God becomes actively involved in your life for many different purposes. Obviously, one is that of deliverance. But not only being delivered from those who attack you, those who want to harm you, but also learning spiritual truth in order that you can do that which is pleasing to God and realize there's a relationship between those two things. When you want to please God, accomplish his purposes, the enemy that desire that you have to walk obediently with God, that causes you to appear on the enemy's radar. So as you walk in obedience, the enemy is going to attack. And it's only when we learn what this psalm teaches us are we going to persevere victoriously and walk and carry out the things. And here's what I want you to see that are pleasing to God. You make your objective pleasing God, and you're going to find that your life has significance. You are going to experience God's workmanship in your life. He is going to be moving. You will have assurance of his activity daily in your life, and you will know his help on a daily basis. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to Psalm 25. Now, it's a longer psalm than we have been studying, but it is full in a message of biblical principles. That is truth to apply to our life when we find ourselves in similar situations in order that we come through them victoriously what does that mean accomplishing god's objectives let's begin the first thing we see is that this psalm is of david all it says lay david and in this case of david he is the author of psalm 25 and david speaks and he speaks personally he speaks from his heart. He speaks about experiences that he has had, and he knows God's deliverance, God's faithfulness, God's provision in his life. And therefore, because of that, David is a, a great source of knowledge, spiritual knowledge, so that we can once more be individuals that overcome the, the attacks of the enemy. David says, Unto you, O Lord, my soul I lift up. Now, this is an idiom. What it speaks of, David making a decision. When he says he lifts up his soul unto the Lord, what he's saying is this I am placing myself under your authority. That's when spirituality becomes a beginning place in your life until you submit to his authority place everything of you the very essence of your life all your resources all that you have until you bring them under his authority you are not going to be growing spiritually there will not be a pleasing spiritual activity that you are participating in so first and foremost, David says those words, Unto you, O Lord, my soul I lift up. Verse 2. Then he speaks about God not in some distant way, 
but very personally. He says, my God, in you, I have trusted. And here it speaks in this usage of David, not just trusting God now and then, not just because he has a problem that he relies upon him and seeks his help, but what this speaks of is a consistency, the norm in David's life. Now, did he ever fail? Yes, he did. But consistently, the norm was for David in all situations to trust in God, to believe in him, to want and desire God's movement in his life so that David could be pushed forward into the things of God along God's pathway. So he says, my God, in you I have trusted. And then he says, it's a negative, and he says, I will not be ashamed. And this speaks about a desire. We see something. There is a connection in this passage between trusting in God and not being ashamed. The alternative, now not always is the alternative true, but in this case it is. And that is to say, when I fail to trust him, when I do not act in loyalty to the things of God, when I am not demonstrating fidelity to his word, the outcome of that will always be shame. Now, it may not be immediate. We may not experience it tomorrow or next week, but when we fail to trust in God, we are moving to an experience of shame and shame in this context is not what we want to experience it is a experience that is very humbling in a negative way which means instead of humbling ourselves and being brought closer to god it is when we are shamed and the outcome of that is that we'll we'll feel more distant from god we'll feel unworthy and will actually move away from where we should be. So David says, in you I have trusted, and I will not, it's an affirmation, I will not be ashamed. Then he says, my enemies, they will not rejoice over me. Now, David has enemies and, and realize this. When you say yes to God, you are making yourself an enemy to this world and those who belong to it and the prince of this world, and I'm speaking about the enemy, Hasatan, Satan, the devil, and all of his demonic uh, uh, resources. So David realized, I trust in God, therefore, I'm not going to be ashamed. And he says, do not allow, he says that as an affirmation, my enemies will not rejoice over me. Meaning this, their purposes, their objectives are not going to be realized in my life. They are going to fail and I am going to be what we find so often referring to the congregation to redeem. And that is that we are going to be overcomers. And again, I say this frequently, in order to be an overcomer, there needs to be that which is necessary to overcome. It implies that we're going to have trouble, hardships, we're going to experience the attack of the enemy. So don't be surprised by that. Don't let that uh, uh, cause you to, to crumble and, and think of this as some unique and some wrong experience. No. When you walk in obedience, you are going to find yourself being the target of the enemy. And then he says, verse 3, also all. Now, this word gam, meaning also, is, is very significant. Because what is its purpose is to inform the reader that David's experience is not unique. We ought not come away with the conclusion, well, that's David. 
Therefore, David, God, you know, he was different. God moved differently for David. This is not what David's revealing. He says, what I've experienced, this assurance that I have, that my enemies will not rejoice over me. I will not be made to, to experience shame. David says, also all, that's every believer, everyone who is wise enough to take these principles that David is revealing in this psalm and, and implement them constantly in our life, not just now and then, but they become the, the foundation of our life. Godly principles, we live by them, and they produce, they produce godly activity in our life we are submitting to spiritual laws so david says look again at verse 3 also all and it's speaking here about ones who and some bibles will say wait for you but it's really the word for hope now again there's a relationship between waiting and expectation and hoping these two things are are very close but by and large there are two different Hebrew words that, that relate to waiting with expectation and specifically hope. And this is the word more accurately translated. It's where we get the, the Hebrew noun tikva, meaning hope from. So he says also all, no exclusions, no exceptions, all the ones who are hope, hope is in you. Once more he says, they will not be ashamed. Now, some puts it as a request. Let them not be ashamed. But that's not what it's saying. I, I don't really see in Hebrew this type of, of, of mood. We see something quite the contrary. There is assurance. So he says, they will not be ashamed. Those who hope in you. Who are the ones who are going to be ashamed? It says, the ones who are, are traitors, those who deal improperly with, with others. And this word, it's, it's relating to someone who is not faithful, who does not behave according to fidelity, one who says one thing and willfully backstabs that other one through a, a, a treacherous act a deed that is is not out of loyalty those are the ones he says are going to be ashamed and there's another adjective on that it's the ones who betray who act treacherously and then the word recon which means for nothing and the implication is it's not that they behave in such a a disloyal way because of of some incentive this is their nature they derive pleasure in basically setting someone up for a fall acting in a way that is going to cause sadness despair in someone else and and such a person has what i would call a demonic influence a a satanic character because as we've learned satan that word means adversary he brings adversity into a person's life and and what does he want primarily for that when he works and let me tell you satan is diligent he is hard working and he will do all within his power to bring adversity into the life of the believer and what does he get from that the satisfaction of seeing others suffer how how wicked and evil but that's his nature and therefore those people who behave in that same way that derive pleasure from the hurt the sadness the the misfortune of others even if they're the cause of it those to derive pleasure from that they are indeed uh, going to one day experience shame verse 4 in contrast to that David says your ways, O Lord, make known to me. 
Now, David wants to know the ways of the Lord. Why? Obviously, that he might walk in them, that he might behave according to this revelation. And, and see this very clearly. What David is seeking for is indeed revelation. And that's why it's so important that we do just that, that we live with an expectation that God, who is always faithful, when we follow his principles, that obedience is going to lead to greater revelation in our life. Now, does that mean that, that there's going to be more scripture? No. What it means is this, that we're going to understand the scripture better. We're going to grow in our ability to perceive God's revelation in his word. And we're going to experience, and it's the phrase in Hebrew is hashgacha pratit, which is personal supervision. If we, we translate that literally, probably how a dictionary would translate that phrase, hashgacha pratit, would be providence, the providence of God. That is that God's going to work personally to direct me or direct things around me for my benefit, and my benefit is always found in God's will. So he's going to keep me in his will, and that's what David is asking for, is it not? Look again at verse 4. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me, and then we have a synonym for ways. It's a word for pathways. And your pathways, he says, teach me. Now, one of the questions that you have to ask yourselves is simply this. Are you teachable? Do you really want to know the ways of the Lord? Are you really interested in going, having been taught his way, his pathways? Are you interested in taking that journey, that direction, that course for your life? See, many people are not. They, and I realize that, that this is a foundational thing that I keep going back to because people struggle. There is so much, I want to say it again, there is so much false teaching that God is there to bless our ways. He is not. God is not interested in your ways, your plans for your life. It's his ways. And that's why it's so important that we see these two words, drachecha, your ways, and also orchotecha, your pathways. They belong to him. We need to set our ways, our roads aside and travel upon him, his ways. Verse 5. Again, he uses that same word for ways, but it's in the verbal form. So it's a word for guiding. We have the noun way, and then when we turn it into a verb, it means to guide someone on the way. And that's what David is asking for. So verse, verse 5, guide me or direct me in your truth. Now, we see a big, big message here, a biblical principle. God's way his pathways, his roads, those things that we are called to journey upon, they are always related to his truth. Now, there is a, a big problem, and that is how people are talking about my truth, your truth, and they make truth a very subjective thing. It is not. Truth is God's truth. There's only one source of it. And that source is God, and there's only one place to find it, and that is through his word. And therefore, something that is not clearly founded on the word of God, if someone is, is giving you counsel, and, and they can't, can't show the foundation of that counsel is the word of God, that is not a counselor that I would listen to. Do not think that someone is getting special revelation. They are not. God, he can give revelation. He can re reveal prophetic truth to a person, but it's always going to be in agreement with this. It's always going to be supported by this. So be very wary of those individuals 
that that speak about special revelation david is saying here look once more guide me in your truth and teach me so it's when we and the order is important because it's when we are walking in his way that that walk is also going to be a source of knowledge a source of revelation as we go god's journey walking with him in his objectives we're going to find that in the midst of that god's going to teach us and then he says second part of verse verse five for you he's speaking about god but notice how he speaks about god here the god of my salvation now again if you and and literally we could spend hours hours in this song emphasizing the parallelism the the nuance of hebrew poetry where we learn so much by identifying what corresponds with with what and one of the things we see here is that there is a relationship based upon the wording the grammar the order there is a relationship and don't miss this between truth and salvation and if we are not embracing god's truth which is the only truth now there's much that that purports to be true it is not satan is a father of lies and therefore therefore he says oh this is true you know don't believe that this is fine you can do it this and get away with it you can have everything that you want if you do all these are distortions lies misrepresentations downright things in conflict with the word of god he doesn't care he'll say anything to deceive you and here's the the problem if we're susceptible meaning i want my will and 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 i i just want someone to tell me someone to affirm it's okay so frequently i hear people and they want to be affirmed in their plans and what's so sad is that they, they, they're not interested in truth they get angry when you say i'm sorry but that is a violation just like john the baptist when he says to to this one ruler when he says it is unlawful for you to have her as a wife she is forbidden to you he was speaking truth and and that brought great animosity and even led to his death him being beheaded why because he wasn't a man pleaser beware of these individuals that are so concerned with with getting affirmation from society and others and there's a lot of individuals that are so-called bible teachers whether they be pastors or speakers and authors and you know what else i see i see many people and they are purporting to be some spiritual leader and when it looks at their credentials they have none they well they're an author they self-publish something that's fine it may be a great book but they don't have any academic credentials they have not been taught on how to study god's word and so frequently i hear this people will come and, and believe that they have have come up with an issue that that needs to be solved that needs to be debated about needs to be studied and such and what they don't realize is that that the founding fathers they have discussed this there has been councils in regard to this this is not a new issue it's a new issue to them because they haven't been educated in the faith and the matters of the faith so we are living in a society of of great great uh, uh blindness to the things of god and some people like this blindness because it gives them the the false sense of well i can do what i want so we read but you 
are the God of my salvation. And you, and this is emphatic in the text, and you I have, and here's the same word, hope. It is the word, ki viti. You I have hoped all the day. And that means all day long, but it can also be understood not just all day this day, but it's consistent. Yesterday, the day before that, the day before that, tomorrow, the next day. David is speaking about consistency in his life. His relationship with God was not on today and off tomorrow. For this situation, yes. For that situation, no. David was fully committed to the truth of God. And God had shown himself faithful to David to be called the God of my salvation. And that word salvation speaks of victory and deliverance. So David had a history of, of God experiencing God's deliverance and help. Verse 6. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your grace. Now, it's interesting because, and I've shared this before, that the word mercy is rachamim. It's always in the plural, like the word life, when it's a noun, chaim. But the word chesed can be singular or plural. And here, because they're parallel to one another, we see that both are in the plural. So he says here, remember your mercy, O Lord, and your grace. But it's in the plural speaking of God's abundant grace, God's dominating grace. God's grace dominates all all things for from and here's a term olam from eternity literally it says they are and when it says eternity really this is an adjective that's related to the kingdom so god's mercy and god's grace they're both abundant they both dominate they both are related to the will of god i want god's mercy which usually relates to forgiveness. God, nevertheless, I don't deserve it, but nevertheless, because he's merciful, God, God works in my life. He moves in my life. And, and therefore, as an outcome of receiving his mercy, it then positions me where I can be a recipient of his grace. And God's grace it brings about a change. Not only, see, mercy brings about a change in my relationship with God. Grace, it brings about a change in me. It produces regeneration and it, it changes me whereby I become committed to the will of God. So when a believer, a so-called believer, says, oh, I, I, I strongly believe in the grace of God. I'm a recipient of God's grace, but they have no desire to obey his will. That person has been deceived. They haven't understood biblical grace. They have believed in something that is a distortion from the Bible. So he says, remember. And this word remember, you probably have heard me say this word, l'zkor. Here it's the, the imperative, zahor always relates to covenant so david is saying remember and it's based upon a covenantal relationship that he can expect god's mercy and god's grace and these things they are from eternity but we need to see eternity as a kingdom word they are connected to the kingdom of god if you are not a recipient of god's mercy and his grace you will not will not have a kingdom experience so these things are critical for us he says in verse 7 the sins of my youth and my transgression do not remember and you know how i can be assured that god will not remember my youthful sins and my transgressions because i'm in a new covenant relationship 
And part of that new covenant relationship that we read about in Jeremiah chapter 31 and in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 is that God will not, he's obligated to forget my sins, my transgressions. He says, I will not remember them. Now, the word remember brings about activity, brings about a response. We want God to remember his covenant because that covenant obligates God. And I'm choosing my words very carefully. This covenant obligates God to move, to behave according to what he has promised, what he's agreed to in this covenantal agreement. Well, in the new covenant, God has obligated himself. He's chosen that. He's the author of the covenant. And he says, I have chosen not to remember their sins. Anyone who's in a covenant, a new covenant relationship, through the grace of God, who's experienced the mercy of God, through the Savior, Messiah Yeshua, that person is not going to see God's activity in regard to their sinfulness. That activity was fulfilled when? on the cross now i'm speaking of this from an eternal standpoint obviously a believer if i sin there can be human consequences there can be spiritual effects but those sins once they're under the blood of messiah once i enter into that covenant they're not going to keep me from experiencing god and the king of kings in his kingdom so we read in this passage, remember your mercy and your grace, for they are of the kingdom, we might say. My sins of youth do not remember nor my transgressions. According to your grace, remember me, you. And that you is God, it's at the end of the text for emphasis. So, David, three times we've seen here the word remember. David has assurance of these things. They're not a, a hope in the English sense, what he wants. Now, he wants these things, but he has assurance because they're all rooted in God's covenantal promises. So he says, according to your grace, remember me, you. And then he says, on account of your goodness. It's a word Tov. Here it's in the form tov. In, in, on account of your goodness, O Lord. Now, what does he mean here, goodness? Well, this word is related to the will of God. So David is saying, you know, be merciful to me. Extend me your grace. You're going to deliver me. You're not going to remember my transgressions and the sins of my youth. But, but remember grace. What did I say? Grace is tied to the will of God. And David is acknowledging that when he says in this passage, on account of your goodness, which is related to your will, O Lord, verse 8. Good, here's that same word, good and upright, O Lord. He's saying that God, he's concerned with that which is good, that which is according to his plan and that which is upright and that describes the will of god it is good it is upright and he says therefore he will teach and this is so important god will teach sinners that's me and you he will teach sinners where will he teach us notice what it says in your way now we need to understand this in two ways and it's not either or which one is right they both can have the same degree of rightness here's what he's saying one view is and here again i believe both views are equally correct they they summarize the experience when i as a sinner i experience god's forgiveness his mercy his grace when i apply his truth to my life that truth propels me it positions me in god's will in his way so god will teach me 
his way, what his desire is, what his will is, what his commandments are. And then in his will, he will also teach us as we move along in his will, in obedience. That obedience comes to be a source of revelation as well. Verse, verse 9, he says here, same word, guide me. He will guide humble ones in judgment. Now, this judgment is a, a word of perspective. It's a word of making right decisions. We were talking with some people not too long ago, some, some dear friends, and they said something that, that really resonated with my wife and I, and that is they were saying how rare believers that have discernment. And they're absolutely right. And the reason for this is we're not applying biblical principles to our life. When we fail in doing that, we're not going to have discernment. So we read in this passage, verse, verse 9, he says, Humble ones, he will guide, he will direct in judgment. Also, he says, and he will teach humble ones his way. So earlier, we need to be in his way. How do we find that? A founding principle of spirituality is humility. If we are not humble, it is going to hinder the ministry, the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Pride says no to God's revelation. When we walk and behave in pride, God's not going to give us revelation. We're going to be left to ourselves. Pride isolates us. Humility, what does it do? He says here, humility brings about God directing me in making right decisions, judgment, having proper discernment. He will teach humble ones his way. Verse 11, all your ways, O Lord, are grace and truth. Isn't that a great verse? All the ways of God. And this is the word for pathways. Remember, there's a word orach and derech. This is the word orach in the plural. All your pathways, O Lord, are grace and, and truth. And the ones who keep his covenant and his statutes. Now, what he's saying here is this. It's grace and truth that leads me to be one that wants to keep his covenant and his, and the word here is uh, testimonies, but it's really a reference. Most scholars see this as relating to the commandments of God. So here's the message. When I am experiencing grace and truth, that is going to lead me to what? Notice what he says. It is going to lead me to be a keeper. God's grace and truth works in my life that I'll be a keeper of his covenant and his commandments. Verse 11, on account of your name, O Lord, what's name synonymous with character? Behaving in this way is going to change my character. And if you're wise, you need a character change. If you're married, just ask your spouse, do I need some changes in my character? I assure you, they will affirm that you do. Because they know you for who you truly are. And we all need a character change. Hopefully, we desire that. But just wanting it doesn't make it happen. It comes about, just like he says here, through grace and truth, being a keeper of the covenant and his statutes, his commandments, on account of your name, O Lord. And then he says, as God grows us and teaches us, we're going to realize our need for additional forgiveness. And that's why he says, and you will forgive my iniquity. Why? For great is he. So he speaks about God's greatness in mercy, forgiveness, extending great grace to us. 
He is, and the word is rav. If we say uh, thank you and we want to say thank you very much, toda raba. This is the same word, raba, but in the masculine, rav. Great, exceedingly amount. And God, he does forgive in an exceedingly great way. That's the promise that he's making. Verse 12. Who is this, the one, the man that fears the Lord? Now, who is the one that, that fears the Lord? What's the evidence of that? Well, he tells us. He will teach us, or he will teach him, the, the way he chooses. Now, it's very important that we understand this correctly. What it's saying is this. When we have the fear of the Lord, God, he will teach us, and he will teach us in this passage in order that his way he will choose. Who will choose? The one who is fearing God. So it's the fearing of the Lord that is giving him priority that is going to cause God to teach me. So I will choose his way. It's only through this process. So if God's not important to me, if he's not the priority of my life, God's not going to be my teacher, and therefore I'm going to not choose his way, I'm going to choose my way, or I'm going to choose the enemy's way and I'm going to succumb to their temptation, their, their plans, their schemes, and instead of being victorious, I'm going to be experiencing shame. Verse 13. His soul, this is the one who fears the Lord, his soul in goodness, and this is the word good for, for God's will. So his soul in the will of God he will lodge, he will place, he will cause him to dwell there. Where? In his will, in God's goodness, and associate God's goodness with his will. If you want to experience God's goodness, get into his will. And it comes about by putting these principles into action. Second part of verse 13, and his seed, meaning this, if I am one that fears God, God is going to teach me his ways. I'm going to make wise decisions, God's decisions. And that's going to put me in the midst of his will. What am I going to receive? The promises of God. That's what I hope for, his promises. And those promises are going to be so abundant, they are going to affect and my offspring. That next generation, that's what he's saying here, they also will inherit this, this same thing. What's that? And his seed will inherit the land. Now, the land is the promised land. Land, oftentimes when we see it in the Bible, relates to the promises and the purpose of God. First, verse 14. It's a word, sod. Sod is a secret so the secret of the lord is to those who fear him it's just another way of saying revelation is given to those who fear him and his covenant god will make known that's literally what it says and his covenant he will inform them those who fear the lord they are going to be the ones notice what the text says they are going to be the ones that that uh, experience God's revelation through his secret things, and they're going to be made known. And this word for knowing is an experiential one. When it says he will make known his covenant, it's his covenant promises. They're going to know them, that is, experience them. They are going to reap the benefits of walking in the fear of the Lord, verse 15. David goes back to making this personal. He says, my eyes are continuously to the Lord. I'm looking to him. I want to please him. I want to hear him. I want to follow after him. So my eyes always are to the Lord. For he, 
Notice what the benefit is. When God is my priority, when I look to him, for he will, will set my feet, meaning deliver, he will bring forth my feet from the net. Now, the enemy, what is the enemy trying to do? The enemy is trying to capture me and to capture and bring me to where he wants me to be. Just like an animal is captured and then killed and, and partaken of. The enemy wants to feast on you. And it's only God, only God, his word, only his word, his revelation that can be utilized in our life to bring his personal supervision, his providence into our life in order to set us free from the traps of the enemy. And that's why David says, look now at verse 16, turn unto me, he's speaking to God, turn unto me. Do I deserve it? No. That's why he says, be gracious unto me for alone and afflicted am I. David is now calling out, remember he makes it very personal in, in this section. David has been wounded. He has been injured by the enemy. And that injury has caused him to be captured and he realizes the only hope that he has of being set free, being delivered. And by the way, this word when it says to, to set free, to bring forth my feet from the net, this word, Laotzi, is a word that's related to redemption. It is the same word that speaks of the exodus from Egypt, the children of Israel being brought out of, of bondage. So God is doing this personally for David. David is alone and he is injured. He is afflicted, but God's going to help him. Verse, verse 17, the troubles of my heart, they have increased. Now it's a word for brought. And what David is saying is this, as my heart reflects, heart is synonymous with mind. As I reflect upon my situation, the troubles, and it's in the plural, very significant, abundant trouble is, is broadening itself all around me. Troubles are increasing. And what does David say? And from my distress, and this word distress is also in the plural, from those things that bring distress, and he uses the same word, bring me forth deliver me and it's this word leotzi related to redemption what david is saying is this if i don't experience your redemption and redemption involves ownership that which is redeemed becomes the purchase possession so when we say god set me free deliver me and we want it in the context of redemption. We become God's purchased possession. And as Paul says, what is our response to that? We want to glorify God with, with our body, meaning our existence, our resource, everything that we are, the very essence of our life. We want to bring under his authority for his purposes. Verse 18. David says, see, still speaking to, to God, see my afflictions and my, my toil, my labor. And this word probably in this context relates to suffering and pain. So David says to the Lord, look upon my afflictions and my suffering. And notice what he says, forgive. Now it's a word to lift up. But many times in the Bible, forgiveness is lifting up us from our sins, removing our sins. So he says, verse, verse 19, verse 18. No, verse, verse 18. And forgive all of my sins. Now, I would highlight this because I find great, great encouragement 
in this. You know what this is saying? David is saying, I've blown it. I have succumbed to temptation or I've been deceived. I have not chosen wisely. I have pursued my course of action, my desires, my will. I have believed this lie about my destiny. I have I've followed my dreams, which were not from, from God, but, but rather from the enemy. And I, I wrongly appropriated them to be from God. And now I'm in a mess. And I have sinned. But the good news here, what David is saying is, all of this is a consequence of my disobedience, but you forgive. Notice what he says. Sa lecho, lecho for all. And then it says, chatotai. All, chatotai is all of my sins in the plural. Look at my enemy. Now, verse 19, look at my enemy, for they are abundant or they are many and who are his enemies these numerous ones they are one that see not hamas sinenu uni, which means a a hatred for nothing they hate because they love to hate so they hate not out of a cause they hate for nothing they hate me with a a hate and this word for nothing is a word of violence it's the word hamas so a a hatefulness of hamas they hate me verse 20 he says my soul guard and deliver me so david is always constantly turning even in the midst of disobedience and failure in his life spiritually, he remembers this unbreakable covenant. One that is rooted in mercy, in grace, and therefore as a wonderful example to us, he says, verse, verse 20, keep my soul, guard my soul, and deliver me. I will not be ashamed. Why? For I have taken refuge in you. Even when we've blown it, even when we are in the midst of disobedience. See, Satan will tell us, you can't turn to God now. You have been deceitful. You have sinned. You have, have gone against the words of God. He doesn't want to hear you. Wrong. A lie again God is continuously always open as long as you have breath to say it God's willing to hear it and that is oh God save me I have sinned I have failed but I'm turning to you and what Satan does what not want you to do he does not want you to take refuge in him in God but David does and in David says I will not be ashamed for I have taken refuge in you. And this is also a word that relates to, to trust. Verse 21. The word tone can be integrity. It can be blamelessness. So David says, integrity and uprightness, they will keep me. These are the things that, that preserves us. That, that gives us assurance that God's going to move in our life when we behave with integrity and uprightness. Now, you can lie to, to others. You can't lie to God. Now, when I say you can, that is not a, an encouragement to do so or permission. I simply mean it's possible to lie to someone and they not know it, at least not in this age. There's coming a moment of all truth. Everything that's going to be real, everything that's hidden is going to be uncovered. So eventually all your lies will be found out. Very soberly, sober thought. But you cannot ever lie to God. He knows it's a lie. So David is saying here, very good counsel for us. 
he says, integrity, we might think with integrity and uprightness, he will, these things, deliver me. For I have hoped, this is the third time we've seen this word, I have hoped in you. David continuously, in the beginning of the psalm, in the middle of the psalm, and now at the end, David affirms that his hope is in the Lord. What are you hoping in? What are you trusting in? Who are you believing in? If it's not the biblical God, the God of Israel, and his only begotten son, the Savior, the only Savior, the one who can redeem me from all evil, as it says in Genesis chapter 48, if it's not in him, you are without hope. You may have hoped in this, you may have hoped in that, but it's not going to produce anything but eventual shame and eternal shame. But when you hope, when you hope in the Lord, there's going to be a response. Let's conclude last, last verse, verse 22. Great word, it's a word for redeeming, but it's that payment for redemption. He says, God redeemed Israel. Very important. Israel. Doesn't say Palestine. Don't use that term. It's an abomination before God. You need to know what that word Peleshit means that the word Palestine is derived from. If you knew, you wouldn't use it. It is a word of deceit, treachery. It is a word of failure. It's the exact opposite of what Israel is all about. God never is going to redeem the land of Palestine. Now, those individuals, they can experience redemption by believing in the Redeemer of Israel. But God says here, God has redeemed Israel. He's done so from all of his troubles. This is only the work of Messiah. Most scholars agree. When we look at this last verse, there's a clear reference to the Redeemer, God's Redeemer, who is Messiah. And Messiah is able, and he's also willing to do just that, to redeem us from all of our troubles. And in doing so, we are brought into an eternal covenant, a kingdom covenant, whereby we know God's activity in our life. So let me close with this. Does this interest you? Does God's activity continuously, constantly in your life something you desire? Or do you want just God to be your problem solver? When something goes on that you don't like, then you say, God, deal with that. God, take care of this. That's not faith. That's not a covenantal relationship. That's not based upon any, any type of revelation from this book. That is simply the same characteristic as idolatry. And it is a stench. It's an abomination in the nostrils of God. God wants all of you, all of your thoughts, all of your words, all of your actions. Where did we begin by? bringing everything, the very essence of who we are, under his authority. And the only way to do that is by entering into a covenant, that new covenant through faith in Messiah, his work on the cross, and taking this book and applying it to your life. If you do that and just follow the principles that we've talked about in this hour together, your life will be transformed eternally transformed because you're going to find that psalm 25 if you take these principles and and implement them they're going to bring about great kingdom reward in your life well i'll close with that until next week shalom from israel